Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. Um, I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the dean at the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. Um, I'm really excited to introduce and welcome back today's speaker, Michael Smith, who's our MBA, one of our own from 1986. Michael earned his MBA from Berkeley in marketing and finance. After earning his bachelor's degree in science, technology, and society from that school that shall not be named, <laughs> Stanford University. Um, as a leader who consistently questions the status quo, Michael says of himself that he would prefer to build, quote, what's next over managing, quote, what is. Um, Michael joined NPR in 2020 as their chief marketing officer. He set out to ensure that both the NPR audience and content reflects the diversity of America. As a media executive who has spent his career finding new ways for people to consume content across an increasingly diverse audience population, Michael is uniquely qualified to take on the role and the challenge at NPR. He has more than 30 years of experience in entertainment brand content, um, digital and revenue generating brand extensions, and he's held prior leadership roles at both digital channels for Scripps Networks and cooking channel and food category brand extensions. He's also held roles at the Food Network, Disney Channel, and CBS. Thank you so much, Michael, for taking the time to speak with us today. We're very grateful to have you and have you back because we know you were here last year at this time. And it's so great to have an alum here in the room with us, at least virtually in the room with us. And we really look forward to an informative discussion. So now I'm going to turn over uh, the conversation to Mukunda Sastri and Elsie Mora, who are both part of our full-time MBA program, and they will lead the conversation. After that conversation is over, you will also have an opportunity to ask some questions. So take it away. Great. Thank you. We're so excited to be here today, Mike. Uh, I am a first year uh, full-time student. I came from media and entertainment. I am a co-president of the Digital Media and Entertainment Club, as well as the Business Latinx uh, a Club. And I'm also part of Consortium. And thank you again, Michael. My name is Mukunda. I am a second year in the full-time program. I also come from media and entertainment and super excited to share your love of entertainment with this community. Well, it's great. Thanks for having me. It's just exciting to be back. Anytime anybody from Haas asks me for anything, uh, I'm just so excited because it was definitely, maybe this is an overstatement, but it was a transformational time in my life when I was in business school and uh, just love to, to reconnect whenever I can. Lovely. We'll go ahead and write, uh, dive right into the questions. So the first one is, you know, you're CMO of NPR. You have had a very successful career do you wake up and just pinch yourself and think, how did I get to this position? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do feel lucky. I think anybody who works in the media and entertainment business should feel lucky. I mean, we get to do uh, things th around things that most people consider to be, as you say, entertainment. It's fun. I mean, I grew up you know, watching television and reading the newspaper and listening to the radio and just enjoying it as a consumer. And to think that you know, what I get to do every day is just make the things that I actually consume and like, uh, yeah, it's a treat. And Michael, there are several folks here in the room that are really excited about joining a career in marketing. I think you'll, you'll see that across Haas, we have several students interested in product, in sales, um, particularly product marketing. For someone who, uh, for those of us who might be interested in entering those types of careers, I'm just curious to hear from you, your career in marketing, what does the, the day in the job of a CMO look like? Uh, could you tell us, what was on your calendar yesterday in some important meetings and sort of what's on your mind on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I and mean, one of the thing, nice things about marketing is that no two days are the same. I mean, I think that the mission of what you do is the same. I mean, our, our job is to connect more people to our content and, and, and to our brand. 
Uh, but what you do on a day-to-day -day basis really varies. I mean, we're the voice of the audience throughout the organization. You know, I always like to use this sort of framework when, it, when you think of media organizations is there's about five key functions that they perform. The first is that they make content, then they package the content up, you can call it product. Then they figure out how to distribute that product, where to put it. And then the fourth thing they do is to promote and market the product. And then the final thing is to actually figure out ways to monetize and make money off that product. And we're in that, you know, we're the promotion and marketing people, but we also uh, are part of the audience intelligence um, apparatus within the company, which informs the content making and informs distribution decisions and also informs our our sales, uh, our ad sales department that monetizes the content. So I get involved in a lot of different conversations across all these parts of the company. I mean, you specifically to your question about what was on my calendar, uh, I was in a meeting with our distribution team talking about uh, our, uh, our, actually our product and distribution team talking about the NPR One app, which is the app, our, our audio app that we've created to help people consume you know, our radio stations and our in our podcasts, and we we're just having some conversations about how to evolve that app and brand that app, and and whether we wanted to have two apps or one app, or what mm. kind of features we wanted to have in the app, and and uh, and you know, what our consumer intelligence tells us about that. Uh, and then I, have, I had another meeting, which was about our organizational structure, was how uh, we structured marketing and and uh, audience insights, and our business development team, which is another group that I oversee, which deals with our. Uh, licensing and brand extensions and uh, and what's the best way to structure those. Um, um, I also oversee our design team and, and we do design around our marketing communications, but we also do design around our, our products as well. And, and there are conversations about the line between UX design, say, and, uh, and brand design. So it's a variety of things. You have a lot of designers and product enthusiasts in the room. So <laughs> if there's ever any a time that Haas students can help out with these product <laughs> ideations, I think we're open. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the interesting things I know from when I first got into the media business that that's evolved is you know, I talked about the content and then the product uh, or, or packaging part of it and then the promotion and distribution. But that packaging part was not as salient, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, tell, you know, media product was, you know, it's a movie or a television show or a radio broadcast and there wasn't really a package around it. I mean, there was, you, know, you saw it on a movie screen or on a television set, or maybe there was a sort of a CD package or a record mm -hmm. or something that you could hold in your hand. But um, the, the digital era has created this whole new thing called an app. And the app is the package, you know, that you experience the media content in. And, and for, I think for consumers, that experience of how the product is packaged within the app is, you know, almost in, for some products like a TikTok, you know, obviously right. is even more important sometimes than the content itself. So that's an exciting thing I've seen happen over the last 30 years. Yeah, and you know, we have heard how you have transitioned from different roles and all the companies that you have worked in. How do you tackle going and working at, at a new company and smoothing out that transition from role to role, from company to company. Is there any research that you do, any set of criteria or any set, set of steps that you sort of as a ritual undertake before and while you're newly joining a company? Yeah, you know, when I was a student, I was one of those sort of uh, you know, pull all-nighters, cram before the, <laughs> the final kind of mm -hmm. people. And uh, that's the way I used to ad address joining a new company was to kind of pull an all letter and try to learn everything you possibly could. But I had some really great advice from a, uh, from a boss years ago, a mentor, that you know you need to take that pressure off yourself and realize you're going to be working at the organization for hopefully a very long time. And to give it time, you know, the organizations are very multi-layered and nuanced and, and, uh, and you're probably going to have better insights and opinions on what to do after you've been here for two months or three months and you've had a chance to really understand the the organization than you will on day one so don't you know beat yourself up thinking you've got to know everything uh, the day you walk in so i try to give myself time in the first couple of months to just listen you know just learn and walk around meet as many people within the organization uh at all levels people and people who have been there 20 years people who are new and just try to understand the anthropology of the place first and then try to apply some of the lessons and uh, you know, things that I've picked up over the years and things I learned at Haas <laughs> uh, you know, to, to the circumstance that I'm in. So specifically for NPR, you undertook this sort of approach. What were some of the findings and who were some of the people that you were speaking to that uh, helped illuminate your path forward? 
you know, one of the first things I did in the, uh, when I was, uh, before I started, was I went back and read a lot of uh, thesis papers that students like you, you know, you guys have projects where you do, you know, do uh, cases on companies and, and there's some really good ones that students have done over the years on NPR. Mm. <laughs> and so I read some of them, uh, you know, analyzing the company and its history. And I also looked at the, so the original founding documents for an NPR, the original mission statement. And, and I realized that, uh, that they were written by a guy named Bill Simmering, uh, who created, who was one of the first program director, actually was the first program director for, for NPR. And I, you know, just on a lark, you know, just reached out to him. He's, he's retired, he's in his, you know, in his 80s. And, uh, and he was so gracious to, to spend time with me through email and just on the phone talking about the founding of NPR and what his vision was years ago. And it just really helped me again back to that anthropology get to understand the sort of DNA of the organization, and then I did that with conversations through conversations with other uh, longtime people on the journalism side and and other employees just to kind of understand you know where especially with an organization that's been around for a long time, you know how we got to where we are, uh, which helps create uh, just a better understanding of the context in which whatever change we need to make is going to occur. In. I like that you're elaborating and articulating on these themes of just listening, learning context, understanding culture of sort of the environment that you're going into. In this room where you're speaking to, it's MBA students. We're all very excited to be in this environment and sort of learn as much as we can. But half of us are about to go out into the real world and graduate and get full-time careers. What are some of the best takeaways that you might have for us as we sort of go into our next jobs? And what do you think we should be thinking about as we sort of look for that next opportunity? Or if we have secured that opportunity, how can we sort of bring our best selves to that new environment? Well, I think the perennial uh, challenge for an MBA student is the, you know, the, the, the edict of like, follow your passion is what people have always said, you know, for years, you know, find or find, first find your passion. Hopefully in some time in business school through, through internships and classes, you got to find the thing that you think you really want to do. Uh, and then follow your passion, but then you follow that within the constraints of uh, you know, two years of incredible uh, expense and, and, and student loans hanging over your heads. <laughs> so, so <laughs> we really you know, kind of, when I was a student, that was you know everybody was going to Wall Street because that was where the big money was, even though it might not have been where their passion was. Um, you know, looking back years later, I, I think what you really should do is find the thing that you know if you if you. Um, uh, you know, had won the lottery tomorrow and didn't have to work for money, what would you just do? You know, what would you mm. just do because you enjoyed it? And try to find something closer to that. Because I think if you're better motivated and more excited about what you do, you're probably going to have more success in that career and ultimately more financial reward than jumping at the thing that has the great starting salary that you don't really love, but you think it's gonna you know, pay down your loans. That's a career you might start uh, and then sort of stall out, you know, after a few years. So I think it's kind of figure out, you know, there's a, a book years ago called What Color Is My Parachute? And it's that thing about, you know, what is, yeah, what is the thing that really you know, makes you want to get up in the morning uh, that you want to go do? And, and uh, uh, you know, that's hard to find sometimes, but hopefully, you know, in the two years you're in school and through internships and through informational interviews and networking with people, you can get a better sense of that. Mm -hmm. And then also don't beat yourself up if you know that first job or two you know, after B school isn't exactly the perfect fit, because that's also part of that journey of figuring out where you really need to be. But to that point then, I guess this was, those are some of the successful things we should be looking for. But what about some of the mistakes that you've seen from newly minted MBA grads or perhaps MBAs you've seen in the workforce, uh, what are things that we can be actively looking out for that we should perhaps think otherwise about? Yeah, I think sometimes people, uh, you know, will chase the herd, like, oh, everyone's going to work in, in uh, you know, Web3, or everyone's going to work in AI, or, uh, <laughs> um, and, and uh, without saying, you know, what is it that you really want to do, and then also, not researching the culture of the organizations that you're going into mm. deeply enough to make sure that there's really a fit and alignment with, 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 with who you are. Uh, I think that's something I've seen change over the years. I know when I was younger, it was more like you know, boot camp. We just figured, just get a job at you know, one of these big name companies because it's, it stamps your ticket for future success and you put up with a lot of things in the culture and who you worked with that 
uh, you felt like it was almost like a badge of honor to just kind of get your feet in the door. And I right. think now people are demanding, no, you know, you, you know, I have a lot of knowledge, I have a lot of skill. It's, you know, it's a tight labor market right now, so you guys have a lot of leverage. And let me be more selective and, 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 uh, and ask people about, uh, you know, what I'm really going to be getting into. So the media landscape, as we know, is constantly evolving. And even when you started in your position, uh, the world, uh, the pandemic had really taken full force. How have these changes informed and shaped your strategy? And how do you think your strategy is working out um, two years into, into the job? Yeah, I think the pandemic has just accelerated things that were already in, in motion. You know, I, I think the two sort of meta trends that have been going on in media, you know, probably you know, for the last 50 years have been, one, the change in technology and how people engage with the content, you know, from whether it's you know, from broadcast TV to cable to the internet, uh, you know, from movies to streaming. And then the other big meta change has been the, the increasing diversification of America. I mean, you know, when NPR started in 1970, you know, over 80% of Americans were white and, you know, I think less than 6% were, you know, were Latinx and 9% and were African American. Today we're in a country, you know, that's about 60, 40. And if you look at people under the age of under 35, you know, it's a, almost a majority minority country. So uh, those two things, those two forces have been, you know, um, relentless through, through, through time. And those are the things I think all media companies uh, are, are, are struggling to react to, you know, the changing ways people consume and the changing nature of the consumer. And I think for NPR, that's been uh, a challenge and, and an exciting opportunity for us. You know, we, we, our mission and why we were created, it was really to you know, provide an alternative to commercial media and to sort of serve the the media needs of the country that aren't being served by the commercial system, and to talk about the stories uh, that you know aren't always covered, to uh, represent groups who aren't always um, depicted, mm -hmm. and uh, to really reflect America. And so that's in fact that's the north star of our company uh, strategy right now is to really, um, really be a true reflection of the audience that we serve. And then secondly, you know, we started as a, primarily as a radio broadcast company. And over time, how people consume audio has really evolved you know, digitally. I mean, it's you know, people stream radio, they listen to audio through smart speakers, you know, they, they listen to podcasts. And uh, you know, we've been at the forefront of innovation in those spaces, but that uh, has been uh, you know, an important shift that we've had to, that we've had to adapt and hopefully you know, can leverage to, to, to towards our mission. And do you find that in your search to broaden and diversify the base uh, that you are navigating a difficult challenge and retaining um, and catering to the needs of, of your previous base um, whose demographics and, and needs are um, substantially perhaps different? You know, the, 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 the nice thing for, for us is that you know, we reach people through radio, but we also reach them digitally through stream, you know, through audio streams and, 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 and more significantly through podcasts. And the audiences, uh, if you look at the podcasting audience versus the radio audience, uh, they are very different demographically. And so it's been nice to be able to serve a whole new audience without alienating an old audience. So for example, you know, there are people who are older and less diverse who, who um, listen to a morning edition every day and, and on the radio. But then there's a whole new generation of people who listen to up first, which is our podcast morning uh, news pod news show, which is you know one of the most popular daily podcasts in the country. But the audience of Up First is you know are people in their twenties and thirties and forties. You know it's a very diverse audience, much more diverse than the radio audience, which tends to be older. So we're able to you know to introduce content that serves the next gen audience, but we also you know put a lot of investment into the traditional morning edition radio sh show that serves the, the traditional audience at the same time. And I think it's an interesting point just to think about even audiences and how different audiences are. We're at a really unique point in sort of the entertainment landscape in this country and around the world where there's just the proliferation of every single company putting out their own type of content product. How do you think NPR sort of stays independent from all of that chatter? Because I think consumers are probably expressing loyalty to two or three services where they're sort of getting all their entertainment options from. How do you envision NPR sort of staying independent and sort of clear of all that chatter and that noise? 
Well, I think being a nonprofit and being mission driven really helps us because, you know, we're not just chasing clicks or chasing eyeballs for just pure revenue sake. We're really, um, you know, chasing a mission, which is we have a belief that, you know, the more informed and uh, aware and intelligent the American population is, the better it is for our democracy. It's better, better for the civility and just okay. in, just just the harmony within our society. That that's that's the core of why you know, I think public public media exists. And so our you know higher goal is to grow the amount of people that engage and are touched by our content, and uh, and to make sure that it, that we're reaching you know the full spectrum of America. And uh, it's you know not about you know. Being the number one service, or you know, competing with this with this guy or with you know with that guy, it's really about making content that we feel like can you know enrich people and making more people aware that it's out there. We feel like we're in a really unique moment in in, in time. Where, you know, we think about the polarization in the United States, all the misinformation, yeah. uh, the, the low trust in media that uh, you know people are looking for. Uh, you know, accurate, trusted, respected, you know, balanced, um, fact-based. Uh, enriching content, and, and and I think this rising thing. I think that was to me, to me when I came to NPR was that when you think about the, the brand awareness of NPR, it's uh, you know, it's it's in the 30s. You know, almost 65 percent of Americans uh, are not aware of the brand, um, which mm. surprised a lot of people. Probably you know in in our circles and the kind of more um, highly educated circles. So there's a huge swath of the population that we need to reach by just making them aware of you know this this really quality um content that we have and, and we found that when we when we put it in front of people they're you know they're pleasantly surprised they like, never heard of that um, uh, um but this is amazing stuff and so that that's what gets me excited every day that's an interesting point because I think um, I highly encourage everyone in the room and those listening to follow Michael on LinkedIn because he's an avid LinkedIn poster and really enjoys uh, posting about entertainment trends. And Michael, you posted recently about CNN Plus and sort of how uh, there is a larger awareness for a different demographic. And I think it's interesting how you're kind of delineating that NPR is mission driven versus CNN is obviously driven by being a publicly traded company as part of mm -hmm. the larger um, Warner Brothers Discovery en entity. So I'm curious, just as Americans consume news, and NPR stri strives to sort of be that independent, mission-driven um, oasis for those that seek it, what would you say does the next five to 10 years look like for that? Well, I think the next five to 10 years for us is, uh, is about getting our content onto more platforms and also kind of rethinking the formats of our content. You know, we, we were pretty, uh, we had one format for, for almost 35, almost 40 of our first 40 years, which was a long form radio show. One in the morning called Morning Edition, one in the afternoon, you know, called All Things Considered. And uh, now we've really been innovating with different forms of content that still provide the same benefit and serve the same mission. So whether it's, you know, a 10 minute podcast or a uh, 30 minute podcast or Insta or a, a one minute Instagram video or a two minute tick TikTok video, which are you know, things that we're doing right now. Mm. Uh, you know, in the culture space, we've, we've always been a place where you could listen to, you know, and discover uh, you know, outstanding artists, sometimes undiscovered and underappreciated artists. And we would have radio shows where you would hear you know, jazz concerts or classical concerts. And we've really been innovating on YouTube with, with, with short concerts with, and concerts in a very unplugged, unstructured way. We, we started a series of where the concerts are actually performed in front of a small desk in our, in, in, in our office called the Tiny Desk Concerts. And, uh, and that's you know, become one of our most popular co content outlets. Uh, so uh, I think that, that you know, more video, more short form, uh, things in different kinds of platforms uh, just experimenting with with all the ways that you can enlighten and enrich and, and inform people. Mm -hmm. One last question before we switch gears, um, just pertaining to entertainment and media. So again, Michael, I've uh, talked to you about how this room and sort of the broader host community in general, they're aspiring consultants, uh, folks interested in product, big tech, um, real estate, finance, you name it, uh, social impact. What would be your elevator pitch to Hossies and beyond for 
entering a career in this space, where this is perhaps more of a smaller industry preference and choice for those entering. Um, how can we convince Hossies and broader MBAs to sort of consider a career in entertainment and media? Well, I think entertainment and media, if, if, if you think about the impact that it has in people's lives uh, and how that's grown in, in, over the last, say, 30 or 40 years, you know, you're definitely working in a part of uh, industry that you know, makes a difference and really has an, an influence uh, uh, on, on the world. And it's a it's a growth industry. You know, I, I, you think about the number of people. I think the, the U.S. Labor Department data would, would back this up. Who worked in media and entertainment, say in 1970, to who work in it today? I mean, it's exploded. In fact, you know, the Nielsen data shows. I don't know if this is good or bad <laughs> for our culture, but the amount of time people spend with media, you know, is I think it's over eight or nine hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, when do they work and when do they sleep? But, but that, that, continues, you know, that continues to grow uh, uh, continually. I think as people have you know, more devices in front of them, you know, they're on their phone while they're really got Netflix streaming in the background, you know, um, uh, while they've got their AirPods in their, in their ears listening to a podcast, podcast. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so uh, there's, uh, so you're in a business that is, you know, exploding in, size and scale uh, with uh, uh, an, an increasing societal impact and importance. Uh, um, so I think that's, an, that's, a, that's one of the exciting things uh, about being in the business. Here's a fun one, Mike. Uh, in your LinkedIn profile, you state that you know a little about many things and a lot about what you still don't know. What are some of those topics that you are not very knowledgeable in and how do you go about bridging that knowledge gap? Oh yeah, I think uh, NFTs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's say cryptocurrency. Uh, Wallets. Uh, you know, cr CRISPR gene editing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different. Uh, I, I'm a real, you know, polymath who just I just curious about a lot of different things. But I think because I'm so curious about so many things, I tend to to not go deep on. Um, many things. So you know, I have a long list of things I wish, you know, like books I wish I could read or, or lectures I wish I could uh, attend. Uh, but I'm really, I've always been fascinated by, um, and it's why my undergraduate degree was in what's called science, technology, and society. So I've always been fascinated by the intersection of culture and tech. And so that's why things like, you know, the metaverse are su you know, super interesting to me. Um, and uh, just having time to go deep on that stuff, though, because it is you know, so nuanced and complex. So uh, as we think about um, our careers long term, um, something that Elsie and I talked a lot about in preparing for today is we both come from environments that were largely homogenous in um, the entertainment media industry. And as both of us as professionals of color coming from the entertainment world, it was tough. It wasn't easy to sort of look around and not find people that look like us or executives that sort of were advocates and champions of our own progress. And so we're even more delighted that you're here with us to sort of share on your journey. I'm just curious to hear from you about, um, especially for candidates of color dealing with primarily homogenous environments, um, what types of questions should we, we be asking of our future employers, whether it be entertainment, media, or anything beyond, any industry beyond, to ensure our own psychological safety in the workforce and to ensure that we are set up for success to continue growing and being the best versions of ourselves? Yeah, I think we're at a really exciting time because, you know, when I got into the business in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, you know, there weren't a lot of Mukundas and, 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 uh, and Elsie's, you know, um, you know, even just the names, you know, I mean, I mean so true. You know, a lot of Bob's and Sam <laughs> yeah. Carol's. So, so it's just, it, it, it just the, the feeling of inclusion was so different that, I mean, I, I, we were just people, like, you know, of my generation, I think we were just happy to have a foot in the door and, mm -hmm. and not even you know, be at the stage to say, 
to, to what you're saying, like the, the demand that, you know, that there be inclusion or you know, what are you doing to make people like me feel safe and comfortable? We were just like, just happy that we're the first ones to even be right. in these companies. <laughs> um, but, you know, hopefully we paved a way to where you've gotten to a stage where, yeah, you can ask those kinds of questions. You can say, you know, wait a minute, it's not just about, do you have a few people in your company, but you know, what's your, 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 your culture? You know, do, is it just, part, is it woven into the fabric of your culture, inclusion and, and, and diversity? And, and um, I think the thing that I've noticed too that, that that's it's so much nicer today is that you know, just the way people dress, the way they speak, the, the, the you know, the hair, hairstyles, to, that you can just show up as yourself. And it's really about just the work. So if you're, you know, you're made, is, is, is it a good podcast? Is it a good movie? Is it, you know, are you making things that, uh, that resonate with the audience? And who cares about, you know, how you, you, know, how you're, how you dress or, you know, um, or all these other sort of uh, superficial things that, that used, people used to use to, to, to really segregate and discriminate against people. Um, so that's, I, I think you can kind of tell when you walk into companies too, do they, do they feel very homogen, homogenous uh, or do you just get, do you just see, um, but, you know, a sense of diversity? I mean, one way to dig deeper is just beyond, you know, the company website and a couple of people that you interview, you know, ask you know, to speak to a, a few different employees in the company, three or four different employees. If you can ask if you can come on site and you know, walk into the lunchroom and just look around the company and get a sense of who, who, who's there. Uh, you know, seek out people maybe on LinkedIn who, you know, were former employees of the company to get, you know, a, a, a perspective. But yeah, I think it really be, you know, do, do, do the due diligence uh, uh, to understand. And to that point, I guess, how do you, as Michael Smith, show up authentically to work every day at NPR as a CMO? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, it's one of the places that I felt the, the ability to be the most authentic because I'm kind of a, you know, a, um, as we call me, kind of a, a nerdy sports fan guy <laughs> uh, who likes to, you know, wear this kind of casual clothes, but be sort of brainy too. And um, and I don't know if you guys watch Food Network. There was a guy named Al, was a guy named Alton Brown who's on Food Network, who's, who's mm -hmm. sort of very similar, I guess, in sort of personality of myself. And uh, and when I came to NPR, I found there were a lot of people that were just naturally like that. There was, they, if you, NPR is sort of like a company uh, of like it feels like graduate students and college professors <laughs> who, who couldn't who couldn't get tenure <laughs> making, uh, radio, making radio shows. Um, but you know, really, you know, really, and, and really committed, dedicated journalists to people, just people who are committed to helping other people understand the world better, uh, and are just comfortable with um, being themselves and doing that. And uh, so it's a really, I feel, it's a fantastic organization in, in in being able to show up as yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but not all, yeah, all companies are, are like that. And it's, it's really reassuring to hear that, that you can find that in future corporate environments. Um, something that we talk a lot about at Haas, especially within the student body, is sometimes just the feeling of imposter syndrome, feeling like you don't belong, or feeling like sometimes you maybe not be as good enough as your peers or your fellow classmates. And that can often get to your head. and it can cripple you. I'm curious in your role uh, as a CMO of such a large organization, have you ever felt that imposter syndrome or that feeling of fear of how can you keep up with sort of the demands of the role? And what are some ways uh, in which you've overcome that if you have felt it? Yeah, I, yeah I've thought a lot about that when you, when, you, when you guys provide that in advance about imposter syndrome. And I, I think you know, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a factor of just uh, the, the age we're in. I mean, when I was coming up, I didn't feel a sense of imposter syndrome because there were so few people like myself, and it seemed to be you know, such a challenge to overcome pre, uh, you know, preconceived biases against people of color into what your potential could be. So it, well, I didn't have the luxury of people thinking that I was <laughs> more than I was, and I was an imposter. <laughs> it was more uh, they you kind of had to prove to them that you weren't what they thought you were and that you actually were smarter than uh, uh, and more capable. Uh, uh, I th you could say that today, uh, there are so many more oppor opportunities. Uh, you know, I think it's never been a better time. Um, you know, it's still long from perfect, but it's never been a better time to be a person of color going into business. And companies really are 
in leaning in and looking to diversify and uh, um, looking for you know, highly qualified people of color. And so, uh, you know, sometimes that uh, focus and you know, people patting on the back and saying, "Oh, we're so glad you're here," and you know, and, and you know, we're trying to diversify and we really need you. And and then you, you you get brought in and you probably do feel like, "Oh my God, you know, am I really as good as I think that uh, that I am?" Uh, um, but yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, I, I still think that the general tenor within the American industry is to still underestimate and you know somewhat marginalize the abilities of people of color. So you're still going to need to you know to prove people wrong. So don't ever you know feel like you're not worthy. Um, because you are, and you're more worthy than probably most people believe around you believe that you are. One other question, since we spoke about having um, done due diligence prior to working at a company, um, certainly you did, you spoke to employees, but you were still from the outside looking in, um, definitely in all the companies, but I'm speaking specifically about NPR. What were some of the findings that you, know, you only really gain insight um, to once you're in that may have surprised you that you didn't expect? Oh, and within NPR, you know, one of the things that surprised me was the, the length of tenure that people, a lot of companies in media, and if you read, you know, Variety or Deadline Hollywood or, you know, a lot of the trades, you, there's a lot of turnover in the industry. People jump from company to company. Mm -hmm. People tend to, you know, work in some place for a couple of years and then they, uh, and I found that uh, just you know, anecdotally, that like the average tenure of an NPR employee was at least eight years. You know, wow. Many people 10, 15, 20 years. And so that was that was a surprise to me. It's like you know, what what is about what is, is it about this place that people are working here for such a long time? You know, because you know it's a nonprofit, so it's not necessarily that people are making you know outrageous salaries, uh, but there's some reason why they're they're dedicating you know, the majority of their careers to this place. Uh, and so that was intriguing. And you know, as I found out, it's really, really about that, re that emotional and sort of spiritual reward that you get uh, about knowing that the work you're doing you know, is having such a positive impact on the world. It has a, you know, a meaning, uh, you know, a deeper meaning. We're almost at time for um, audience Q&A. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to thank you again, Michael, for always being uh, such a consistent advocate for people of color, for executives, for sort of amplifying talent in any way you can. It really, it just, it's so wonderful to see and experience. And for those who may not know, Michael just casually responded to a LinkedIn request that uh, we had sent him. <laughs> and sort of that's how he participated with us today. So it's just so lovely that you're uh, such a wonderful support, source of support and guidance and mentorship for us here at Haas. And we just really appreciate all that you do for us. Well, thank you very much for having me. And, and you know, we're great credit to, to the two of you and, and the rest of your uh, you know, teammates on having these kinds of opportunities uh, for students to, you know, to hear other perspectives and hopefully get some advice that helps them. Thank you. We're hoping you can stay with us a little bit longer because we want to give the op, uh, students uh, in the room or the audience the opportunity to ask some questions. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, yeah, I, lo I love questions. I was one of, when I was a student. I was one of the, <laughs> I was one of the ones that annoyed my professors with endless questions. So, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can go to the mic behind you and identify yourself. Um, if someone would like to, uh, what? Well, she's walking towards the mic. Let me. The, let me just t say, in my own words, how much I appreciate NPR and everything that you're doing. I cannot tell you over the years the number of times I'm in my car listening to an episode. I get home and I just stay in my car, riveted, you know, <laughs> by whatever it is I'm listening to. I just can't leave, you know, what I'm hearing out on National Public Radio. So over the years, it's just been so amazing, and we're just so grateful for, for, for NPR. So on that note, did you want to ask a question? Is my car? Um, hi, my name is Nina. I'm a second year full time MBA student and just feeling very triggered about having to graduate in a month or so. Um, 
Um, one of my questions is when you're a news organization, you're obviously tasked with having to deliver some heavy news. Like, you know, the world is kind of dark right now, but NPR seems to do a beautiful job of centering joy and connection and empathy in its voice, even while it's talking about really complex topics. And I'd love to know as future leaders of organizations, um, how does that joy and empathy and connection translate to things you've seen take place, you know, in the, in the office and what can we do as future leaders to ensure that no matter what industry we're working in, we're also, you know, carrying ourselves in ways that honor empathy and joy and connection. Yeah, I think one of, <clears throat> one of the uh, hallmarks of NPR's uh, journalistic style is to you know, tell stories through the voices of the people who are experiencing the, the thing that you're talking about, you know, rather than from just the reporter editorializing. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of the unique things you can do with, with an audio because of the intimacy of, of, of the medium. Uh, and so we let the stories unfold, you know, through the people experiencing it, which I think that allows you to, to you know, feel the poignancy, but also feel the hope in the, in, in the people who are telling the story, you know, whether, uh, and I think that's something you can translate into, you know, you know, how you work with your peers and your employees is, is to, again, going back to you know, that listening thing and just uh, platforming the voices of people internally. And it's something that, that you know, NPR really does walk that walk internally, you know, that the number of what we call sort of spate listening spaces that we have within the organization where we get employees together to talk about you know, whether it's diversity issues or uh, you know, the hybrid work issues, work-life balance issues, just have spaces where employees can, uh, moderated spaces, talk about issues amongst themselves. Uh, and it just uh, you know, creates this culture where no matter what your role in the organization, you feel like there's a place for you to have your voice you know, recognized. And, I, and so I think that keeping an eye on that as a leader is, 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 is important. Yeah. Awesome, I thought that was an awesome question. Thank you, Mina. Um, uh, I, my question is a little bit different. It's about competitors. So you mentioned talking about TikTok and you mentioned kind of some other players who I was a little bit surprised about, actually. So I was kind of curious how you think about NPR in terms of various competitors, especially new ones like Spotify and others who are kind of popping up as content creators, new content creators. Yeah, the competition thing is, you know, to me, is very nuanced because it, being as a nonprofit, we're not necessarily you know, competing against the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, um, for our audience. I mean, if you, if you step back for a second and you say, you know, if our mission is to create a more informed public and sort of fill the gaps that commercial media, you know, doesn't fill, you could argue that if somebody already has a New York Times subscription or an FT subscription and reads the Washington Post, you know, they're a person who's pretty well, um, you know, well educated. So that's not really well, you know, the core of why we're here. We're here to help that person you know, who doesn't have access to that information, you know, who can really be empowered by having that kind of information. And so uh, you know, where we compete with them is more in terms of the resources to do what we need to do. So you know, we do earn a, <clears throat> earn a significant amount of resources through sponsorship sales or advertising, we call it, you know, sponsors that buy uh, messaging in our, in our content. Um, you know, we do get membership donations from people. So to the extent that people are consuming the New York Times and, in, in, and not us, then that may you know, harm our advertising revenue. To the extent that they're paying for New York Times subscriptions, you know, maybe that does reduce the amount of money they have to donate to NPR. Uh, but it's not as you know, direct one-to-one -one, like you know, we're sitting there <clears throat> paying attention to how many clicks they're getting versus how many clicks, cl clicks we're getting. Uh, thank you for that. Hi, Michael. This is Dimple. I'm an alum of the Haas School and also um, have looked at Michael as a mentor over the years. I come from the media industry. We met in New York a number of years ago through the Haas Alumni Network, so I definitely mm -hmm. encourage you all to stay in touch with the network. Um, <laughs> my question for you, Michael, today is one thing I know about you is that you've always been super innovative wherever you've been in terms of pushing strategy forward in a very unique way that hasn't necessarily been introduced to C levels in the organizations you've worked for. And I think that part of your magic there is this sort of quiet charisma that you have. And as leaders and future leaders in this room, 
you know, we're all going to have to work with folks who we have to find strategic ways to getting through to them. Um, how have you done that? Um, you know, what are those, you know, personality traits or, you know, maybe there's a story of a time you were trying to get something pushed through and or an idea accepted. How did you go about that? Thank you. Oh, thanks, Nip Dimple. Yeah, great to see you again. Um, the key list lesson I've learned is the value of relationships and just human connection. I think when I came out of school, just to give you guys, guys some perspective, you know, I, I went straight through from undergrad into, in, in, into business school. So I hadn't worked at all uh, you know, full time when I got into the business world. So I, uh, I believe you know, my, that my success had been because of my academic success. You know, if I have the smartest idea and you know, biggest brain, then that's gonna win. You know, that's kind of what happens in, when you're in school. <laughs> and the, I learned the hard way over years that, it, that it's not having the best strategy or the best idea and just trying to, you know, to pound your fist on the table and drill it into people's heads. It really is about winning their hearts and uh, understanding, okay, I've got an idea, I think it's the best idea, but how can I connect with this person and under listen to them and understand where they're trying to go? And uh, you know, we can kind of get there together in coming to, to this understanding uh, um, that was, uh, and a lot of it is building that, that, that relationship capital with people through just you know, popping your head in someone's office, having coffee with them, you know, shooting the breeze about North Carolina and do you know games or or what happened on Real Housewives or, or whatever. <laughs> just building that the, that equity with people will get you to uh, you know, get your ideas through a lot more than you know fantastic PowerPoint and a great you know uh, explanation because people tend to do things I think a lot because of you know their hearts um, over their heads. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, love the conversation so far. Um, my question is a little bit more so on the uh, creator economy, per se. Um, there are a lot of content creators, whether you're TikToks or podcasts whatsoever, and they have very different ways of making a living, making money, and being more mainstream. Um, what are the ways that you have seen creators make this living, and sort of what revenue streams have been there, and how do you see them changing uh, over the past few years, and maybe in the future? Yeah, I think the revenue streams around entertainment, you know, have not really changed in principle from, I tell students this all the time, if you go back to the, uh, the, rank, the ancient rank Roman chariot races, you know, they, they, uh, they had the kind of two or three key revenue generating things. If you look at those, um, those races in the, in the Coliseum, they sold tickets <laughs> to the event. They had um, uh, banners, like cloth banners hanging in the Coliseum with names of uh, little, you know, little businesses on them. <laughs> and then they uh, you know, sold little statues of the, uh, of the chariot racers outside, little wood cart statues. So you know, if you make great content, you can monetize it either by charging people for it, you know, subscriptions. You know, if you're a creator, I guess you, you, know, you have a sub stack or you've got a Patreon channel, you know, people give you money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you can, because of the attention that you draw, based on what you're doing, you can get other people to pay you for that attention, which is advertisers, sponsors, you know, people that want to reach your audience. And then the third is, you know, you can use your you know, brand and IP and likeness to create other kinds of products, you know, merchandise, t-shirts, hats, you know, other things, you know, experiences. Um, and that kind of monetization model has been around, I think, you know, as long as entertainment has been. It's just that now, you know, technology enables more comp complex ways to do that. So instead of selling a t-shirt or a hat at a, uh, you know, at a Jackson Brown concert, which is something I bought 30, 35 years ago, now you're buying, you know, an NFT from, you know, a Kanye West um, live stream, you know. So uh, I think it's just understanding that the, if you do make content, you've got those three different ways that you can monetize. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Emily. Thank you so much for being here. This has been great. As a marketer, I had a question for you about brand awareness, which you had mentioned earlier. I was really surprised to hear how, um, you know, relatively low the brand awareness of NPR is. I was curious, as CMO, how do you go about increasing brand awareness, especially considering the increasing political polarization of people in the U.S. and the separate media bubbles that people live in? 
Yeah, it, it, well, I think the biggest challenge for brand awareness for an organization like us is just uh, financial resources. I mean, you can get huge brand awareness if you, you know, um, spend the money to buy, you know, the, uh, access to, to people's time, to so buying advertising. Um, we have I mean, more limited resources, so we've got to rely more on um, taking the things that people are already engaged with and cross-promoting um, other things that they might be interested in, you know, trying to use other people's platforms. The great thing is people do have a lot of trust and respect and for our brand. So, you know, it's things as simple as having uh, our reporters and hosts on other people's shows. Um, you know, getting social shares of our content uh, in, in, in front of new people. Uh, so, uh, but to your question about the, the, the bubbles and the polarization, I have a kind of contrarian view on this whole bubble thing. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we have more diversity in media outlets and media sources and access to media than in, ever in history. I mean, and everyone can be a publisher. Everyone can have a Twitter feed. There's more discourse, public discourse, than there's ever been in, in world history. So the fact that there's dispute and polarization and people have different opinions, to me, is, it's not new in the world. I mean, we've had, we've had a civil war in the United States. I mean, um, you know, we, we've had, you know, we had colonialization and empires. I mean, it's not like the thousand years ago, the world was this little hunky-dory place where everybody just agreed and, and sung some kumbaya together. So, actually look at it the other way. I think that we are at, we actually have more, uh, um, you know, diversity and more inclusion and, uh, and more uh, harmony than ever before. Because I think that the, the image people have of the past is that, yeah, we didn't have a lot of, you know, dispute between Republicans and Democrats or, the, or between mainstream American and within mainstream American culture. But what they forget is that there were big groups of people who were just excluded from mainstream American culture. So. Yeah, you know, all the, you know, cisgender straight white men all agreed, <laughs> but you didn't, there was no, you know, Native Americans didn't have a story, you know, gender non-binary people didn't have a story, African Americans didn't have, no, nobody else was at the table. So you could say, yeah, we all agreed it was a great America. Now all of a sudden where everyone's sitting at the table, finally, or starting to sit at the table, and people are upset that, well, wait a minute, we're polarized. I don't understand why we don't agree anymore. It's like, well, because you didn't let us in the room before <laughs> to, to disagree with you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Uh, my name is Tara Glenn. I'm actually an undergraduate student. I'm a junior at Haas right now. And first off, I just wanted to thank you for uh, coming back. I was very motivational uh, seeing a black man come back and uh, pour back into the students. But I just wanted to ask you, being in such a successful role and uh, being a black man, um, what, would you, what advice could you give me for someone like a young black man who's aspiring to be in a similar position like you, but having to overcome adversity during that uh, process. Oh, okay. You know, one thing you talked about. Uh, thank, thank you for, for 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 that comment. You know, it just made me think about how far we've come in terms of progress. Uh, when I finished at Haas, I remember being asked to come back. It was maybe like only a year or two after finishing uh, to talk to students uh, to be an inspiration to them. I mean, this is a time when there were hardly any black students at Haas. And so some guy who's 20, 26 years old who works in New York is considered to be an inspiration to the few students that we had. And now I guess it takes you know, being the CMO of NPR to be, be able to come back. <laughs> so, so, so it's great. It shows that, 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 it's a, that, that, that we've come a lot, uh, that there's a lot more people like you um, out there, which is, which is fabulous. But, um, but yeah, to your question about, you know, um, how I guess keys to success, you know, I, I think that the the one lesson this was taught to me years ago is that uh, there's this arc that happens, especially for, for black men, male leaders, that uh, we tend to not do as well in, in career advancement early on, but then tend to do well later in our careers. And the, the paradox is because Oftentimes, when you're younger, there's this sort of these, these preconceptions and you know, stereotypes about you. And so people tend to pass you over for opportunities. But you keep your head down and you keep learning and you keep getting better and you keep getting stronger. And people who get the chances ahead of you 
flame out. And then what happens often, this happened in my career, they come back to you later down the line and say, oh, you're still here? Well, you know what? We got this big board, the house is on fire. We tried everybody else. And you know what? Okay, put this guy in. And, uh, you know, and, then, and because you've been preparing, you actually knock it out of the park. Uh, and uh, that's, that's happened to me in um, multiple times in, in, in my career. But, um, you know, I, so I, I think that that fact sometimes that we are overlooked, it, it, it though creates a quiet strength and it creates a, um, uh, something that people, I think hopefully now are realizing that, that we need to tap into more. Thank you. Hello, Michael. I am also an undergrad student here at Haas studying business and media studies. Thank you so much for the pieces of knowledge that you shared with us this far. Um, a question that I have for you is, as you have navigated your journey for over 30 years, um, early on in your career, what helped you develop a niche and kind of have that clarity in pursuing um, your, like the role that you're currently at? Or do you see that coming? And kind of how do you navigate that journey? Um, I would say, personally for me, I'm currently, you know, as an undergrad student, um, seeking to develop my marketing aspirations. Um, it's been a, a bit of a challenge to kind of find that niche and see where I can merge my passions and my uh, talents. So what advice would you have for someone who is currently navigating that space? Yeah, oh, thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah I, I think that, that uh, you can't really understand what you like to do unless you do a lot of stuff, you know? So, uh, I knew I liked being around entertainment, but I did. I tried to just do it. When I was undergraduate, I started this group called the Campus Entertainment Board, where we just we put on uh, concerts with local bands that we would get from San Francisco and bring them out to campus, and um, we we put you know, throw parties and uh, put on plays, and you know, I played in a rock band for a little while. I just did, did just did a lot of things, and and then those things actually kind of helped me get a sense for what my niche was. I realized it was like, I wasn't the best musician. I wasn't the best actor. I wasn't the best, you know, singer, but I was really good at like kind of putting together the, the thing, the, the event, like making the connection about like, what's the artist that we should have on stage at this party and how much should we charge for the tickets and who should we invite? And how can we make it really popular? I did this, that, so I realized I liked the idea of how to like connect people to entertainment, how to make them like, like, be, like promote, promoting it, making people want to like it and come and engage with it. And by doing that, I got to be around people who were much more talented than me, better guitar players, better actors, whatever. But, I, but my role was to like make a, a spotlight shine on them. Uh, and so that's how I found my niche. Now, you know, maybe if I had found that I was just, you know, a super great musician, then I would have decided I wanted to be, you know, a producer, a writer, or the creator of themselves. But so I think that's where you kind of can, can sense it by just trying stuff out, get involved in entertainment projects at the school level with your friends and other people, and then you'll kind of see where you shine. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I think we are out of time, and I just want to thank you for for your wonderful um, answers to all these questions and also for your great optimism. I mean, you're, you really just have a, a vision which is, is so inspiring to me and, and so positive in so many ways. So um, thank you so much for coming back to Haas. We're very grateful to you. Thanks.